Good morning, everybody. Psalm 98 tells us, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. All you have to do this morning is look around you. Spring has finally gotten here, and you can see what marvelous things he does for us every day. So let us take time this morning now to prepare for our morning worship as we listen to Candace um, leading us with the prelude. I'd like to welcome everybody to Ann Street this beautiful morning. Um, I would encourage everyone to please sign the pew pads and let us know of your attendance this morning. If you're new and just visiting today, we welcome you particularly and hope you will return. We hope you will find this morning a joyful worship experience. 
Um, after the service, we have sip and chat across the street where we have coffee and drinks um, and some snacks and it would give us a chance to get to meet you. We have a lot of announcements this morning. This is just a busy, busy time of the year. Um, first of all, I want to announce that the United Methodist men are meeting this Tuesday night at Rollins at 5.30. This could be a, a great program and lots of interesting topics to discuss, so we encourage all of our men to be there. This week is Family Promise, again, here at our church. Um, and every one of you has worked, I know, so hard in participating in this ministry of our church. But we are in need of dinner three nights this week. So anyone who can fix a dinner for a family promise, please contact Harriet um, and let her know because they have a great need for that. Tonight is a special night. Um, from five to seven, all children and families of K through 12, your 12th grades, are having a special night in the fellowship hall with dinner, fellowship, and a magic show. So this should be exciting. We encourage everyone who normally participates in the youth programs to come, and those who haven't tried it yet, this is a good time to try it. Also, I'll tell you that we are uh, actually, he's a Christian illusionist, not a magician, yeah. That, that, that is a distinction that some people would like to know, so. Okay, we have Easter coming up and Holy Week is coming up very soon. Next week is Palm Sunday. I would remind you that we're having um, a processional of our children for both services and an Easter egg hunt in the, um, during the Sunday school hour. So we would like all of the children to come and participate in our Palm Sunday processional. Um, and I understand, aren't they meeting with the Episcopal Church to process? Yes, they can. Yes, yes. Well, we will uh, get that word out. Yeah. Okay, then during Holy Week, we have Maundy Thursday communion, and that is a cover dish supper and communion that will be held over at the fellowship hall. So we invite everyone to attend that. On Good Friday, we have service at seven o'clock. And Sunday, um, we have the sunrise service at 6.30 and then our normal uh, worship services and breakfast is being served. <laughs> so we have a lot of wonderful activities going on to make Holy Week very, very special. So I would invite you to participate in these and read your bulletin for some of the other things that are going on in our congregation in the next little bit of the future. If you will uh, please stand now and join me in our call to worship. The one who parted the waters to save Israel will set our feet on dry ground. We will walk forward in faith. The one who raised Jesus from the dead will do a new thing in our lives. We will rest in the peace of Christ. Come, let us worship the God of our salvation. Our God has given us love and peace. And let us take a few moments now to share this with the other members here to this morning, and then we will have our hymn of praise, number 529, How Firm a Foundation.
Anakin a rapid ah, the canoe, and he's like, no, I'm not doing this anymore. <laughs> I'm like, may be seated. As the old hymn says, softly and tenderly Jesus is calling, calling, O sinner, come home. Therefore, let us confess our sins in prayer. Merciful one, we yearn for hearts that are filled with laughter and for tongues that are lifted in shouts of joy. But our quiet hopes remain unspoken and our secret fears remain hidden away. Anoint us with your mercy and compassion that we might claim the life that springs forth all around us. Transform us into people who may doubt with hope. In your lovely mercy, we pray. Amen. Hold fast to God's saving acts of old. For the one who parted the waters for Israel is the one who raised Jesus from the dead. And now, if we have any children, they may come forward.
You all look beautiful this morning. Good morning. We're so glad to see you. <gasps> that is so pretty. The Bible in Isaiah tells us that God says, I am doing a new thing. I want you to think back. Can you remember back last fall? And what happened to the trees? The leaves fell down? Yeah, and flowers come back. Well, in the fall, you know, the leaves fall down, and by winter, the trees are bare. Most flowers aren't blooming. It's dark. Everything looks dead. And, and oh, it looks like everything's just dead and gone. But then spring comes. And I know you've noticed in the last couple of weeks, the temperature may have been going up and down. We weren't quite sure. But all of a sudden, trees are blooming. Bushes are blooming with pretty flowers. Oh, I know, they're such beautiful colors. And God is making the whole world new now. Everything is starting nice and fresh. If you also think back to last fall, we had that horrible hurricane. Yeah. And a lot of people lost their houses or had a lot of damage. Yeah. Oh. Well, you know, we had a lot of damage done, trees down everywhere. But now when you look, things are being new again. Yeah. Houses are getting fixed. All the trees have been taken up. And you know, something else God does new for us every day is he gives us a brand new day. Sometimes you have a bad day. Maybe you did things you know you shouldn't have, or somebody was ugly to you, or you're just not feeling real good. So, you know, when you go to bed at night, when you wake up the next morning, it's a brand new day. The sun is up. You've got a whole new start. And Jesus does that with us. When we have done things that we know we shouldn't do, or we are upset, he makes us new, and he gives us hope. He, his promise means that no matter what bad or unhappy ever happens, that he is there with us and he will take care of us and he will make something new. So that's a wonderful promise. Okay, let us pray. Pray with me. Dear God, we thank you that you love us so much that you are making things new all around us, all around us. And, in us. and in us. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Thank you for coming up. Have a I know who should do the children's sermon next week. <laughs> it's so wonderful to see our children um, that know they're loved and know that they're cared about and what they say is important to us, that they're important. That's a big blessing in this church. Our Old Testament reading today is from Isaiah 43, verses 6 through 21. Thus says the Lord, who makes a way in the sea, a path in the mighty waters, who brings out chariot and horse, army and warrior. They lie down, they cannot rise, they are extinguished, quenched like a wick. Do not remember the former things, or consider the things of old. I am about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The wild animals will honor me, the jackals and the ostriches, 
For I, for I give water in the wilderness, rivers in the desert, to give drink to my chosen people, the people whom I formed for myself, so that they might declare praise. The Lord be with you. Amen. Good to be together this day. Thank you so much, Shirley. We continue the reading of the word with Philippians chapter 3. If anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, Paul says, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews. As to the law, a Pharisee. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. As to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of all the surprising value of knowing Christ Jesus as my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish in order to gain Christ. And be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ. <clears throat> the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ, he says, and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death. If I somehow may, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead... Not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize, of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. And the people said, Amen, Amen. You could see the connections between these two scriptures already. The connection of forgetting the things of old. That was in both of these. Uh, some of the times uh, I find that I, whether I mean to or not, I start forgetting the things of old, like where I left my keys. Uh, Many of us were uh, amused uh, by a movie uh, some of you have seen called Finding Nemo. Remember that? Can you believe that was uh, made in 2003? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> we are that old, right? 16 years ago, Finding Nemo was made. The character I liked most was Dory. Do you remember Dory? A little blue uh, tang fish with a severe short-term memory problem. I see some of you going, oh, I love Dory. You could tell Dory something and the seconds later she'd forget it, you know, and she'd go up to somebody and, you know, reintroduce herself over and over again because she couldn't remember that she met that other person. She had a little mantra that helped her kind of keep remembering what fish are supposed to do. Do you remember that? Just keep swimming, just keep swimming, right? <laughs> she makes great comic relief. Uh, because of all this. But there is a, a kind of amnesia that people have, and there are some amnesias that are very severe. And, uh, and, and as much as we think Dory of her is a comic relief, there are some people that have uh, something similar. Uh, you remember the movie, speaking of their movie, uh, the movie Awakenings with Robin Williams and Robert De Niro? That was about that same, maybe it was about 10 years before. Finding Nemo. Um, and the doctor in that is a true story. Uh, the doctor in that was Oliver Sacks, and uh, he died just a few years ago, uh, unfortunately. But he would write up these um, narratives about his patients. And he had one patient named Jimmy. He just calls him Jimmy. I guess that was his, maybe his name. Um, and uh, Jimmy uh, had Korsakoff syndrome. I'm, we've probably never heard of Korsakoff syndrome, but I'll tell you what that is. It meant that someone could have what they call a retrograde amnesia. They could go along and live their lives and then suddenly have amnesia for one reason or another. Who knows? All kinds of things. But instead of just forgetting everything they've just done and kind of 
who they are. Like in the movies, you know, somebody, or the cartoons, they hit their head and then it's like they don't remember where they are, who they are. In retrograde amnesia, you don't start, the part you lose is, is, is a part like out of the middle of your life. All of a sudden, a, a slice, like, a, like you're editing a film or something, you just cut out a scene and, and it's gone. Dr. Sachs said that Jimmy had Korsakoff syndrome and a persistent amnesia. And he started treating Jimmy in the mid-70s. Now follow me here because Jimmy's memory had frozen him for some reason in 1945 when Jimmy had been uh, in the Navy at that time. And to make it even stranger, as I said, he didn't begin having his amnesia in 1945. It just showed up in the 70s. And to Jimmy, he was still living every day in 1945. He truly believed, and I mean, no irony, no, you know, wink and nod. He really believed that Truman was president and that he had just come through the Second World War, which he had, but many years before. He'd been a competent sailor in the Navy and stayed on in the Navy, according to records, through 1965. But all that from 45 to the, pre to the present in the 70s, whew, gone. But that didn't start in 45. It started in the early 70s. Does that make sense? Yeah. Retrograde amnesia. Dr. Sachs tracked down Jimmy's brother, which was not an easy feat in itself because Jimmy was, ceased to be a source of reliable information of anything after 1945. And he came to find out that Jimmy went on after the war to get married in the early 50s, became a father, and by the time he got to Dr. Sachs Hospital, he was a grandfather. But all that, even the people, even the children, even his wife that he married after 1945, at some point in the early 70s, gone from his consciousness. He didn't remember his wife or his children. And as you could imagine, eventually they went on their own way. And he went to the hospital. And in his observations of Jimmy, Dr. Sachs writes this. He says, in adulthood, <clears throat> life, higher life, may be brought to a premature end by strokes, senility, <clears throat> brain injuries. But there usually remains, he says, the consciousness of one's life lived in the past. Usually a sort of compensation like... At least I lived fully, tasting life to the full before I was stricken or what have you. This sense of the life lived before, which may be either a consolation or a torment, is precisely what is taken away in this retrograde amnesia. Now why would I tell you about all that? In these texts, Isaiah and in Paul, they talk about forgetting the things of old, leaving behind some past uh, that needs to be left behind. We're catching up in Isaiah, we're catching up with Israel after they've been exiled to Babylon. Uh, the Babylonians had pillaged their, you know, Jerusalem and the whole area and had removed a great many of the Israelites out to Babylon and to other areas. And so now they live all in these other places. And then eventually, Cyrus of Persia defeats Babylon. And though Cyrus is not an Israelite, the Israelites say, look, he got defeated. You all can come home now. And they could, and they did. And they said, we're going to rebuild. It's going to be great. And about that time, then Isaiah wrote these words, and he says, we're going to come home. We're going to build. We're going to rebuild. So don't forget the things of old. I mean, don't, don't remember the things of old. Uh, don't consider the former things. I'm, God says, I'm about to do a new thing. Do you not perceive it? Those words grab our imaginations and you know, we love this idea of God doing a new thing. And, and we're saying that about Easter and spring and all the things coming up. But on the other hand, should we forget former things? The things of old? After all, don't people say and don't you guys say that some of the best things are the things of old? A lot of times we lament times in the past. I hear people say from time to time, you know, it's not the same ever since they took prayer out of schools. 
Or someone says, takes their car in the shop and the mechanic says, you know, they, they just don't make these like they used to, right? Or another person reminisces about when everybody in town used to work at the factory or the mill or the plant and how much better that was. And church folks, we, we think about the times when everybody in town came to church, you know, and, and people didn't stay home. They, they worshiped in a church every Sunday. So, and a lot of times we... We don't have a good reason. We don't understand why we have to forget the times of old. They were good times. They were better times. But what if the things of old are uh, a history of, of hurt, uh, persecution, famine? Of course, you don't want to remember that. There are whole chapters of the Psalms who remind us that God has done new things. God is continually saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. But those hard times, those things we would like to leave behind, God makes a new way. And I would tell you this morning, as your pastor, that um, there may be things you in your life uh, are ready to leave behind. Things that God has helped you get through and get out of baggage that you should as the old preachers used to say right leave it at the cross leave it there at the cross here we're in Lent and we're approaching the cross and we're remembering all that God has done for us and we can leave our heavy burdens maybe someone has been uh, upset about the loss of an opportunity at your work Maybe someone else has had a dashed hope or dream, the expectation of perhaps a family member that you hoped would go on to great things and didn't. Uh, maybe an um, opportunity you had to, to, to do something with your family and uh, someone's health got in the way or, or what have you. Maybe it's all the way back to that boy or girl of your dreams that got away. Maybe it's that word of wisdom you wished you'd have been able to say in that one moment, but you didn't have it then. And you want to kick yourself that you didn't say it. Maybe it's an old emotional wound that you've brought with you this morning to God's altar. Today we can perceive a new thing. The concept of remembering is not inherently bad. But it's when the memory keeps us from seeing what God is doing new that causes the problem. Search your heart. Is there something that God has called you to leave behind? And even if you don't have an amnesia like Dory or Jimmy, God is faithful to remember you. The story of Jimmy closes with a poignant moment. Dr. Sachs remembers having these words with the nurses on Jimmy's ward. He writes, One tended to speak of Jimmy instinctively as a spiritual casualty, a lost soul, if you will. Was it possible that he had really been desold by this disease. Do you think he has a soul? I asked one of the sisters <clears throat> in this Catholic hospital. They were outraged by my question, but they could see why I asked it. Watch Jimmy in chapel, they said, and judge for yourself. Said I did. He watched Jimmy in chapel, and he says, I was moved profoundly moved and impressed because I saw here in worship an intensity and steadiness of attention and concentration that I had never before seen in him or conceived him capable of. I watched him kneel and take the sacrament on his tongue and could not doubt the fullness and totality of communion, the perfect alignment of his spirit with God's. Fully intensely quiet in the quietude of absolute concentration and attention he partook 
of holy communion. He was wholly held, absorbed. There was no forgetting, no Korsakoffs then, nor did it seem possible or imaginable that there should be. For he was no longer at the mercy of a faulty, infallible mechanism, that of meaningless sequences and memory traces, but was absorbed in an act, an act of his whole being, which carried feeling and meaning in an organic community and unity so seamless that it could not permit any break. Clearly, Jimmy found himself found continuity and reality in the absoluteness and spiritual attention of the act. The sisters were right. He did find his soul here. Let it be so for you and for me. Amen. Our hymn of response is, This is a day of new beginnings. On page 383, we will do verses 1, 2, 3, and 5. So please rise and join me in singing. Please have your seat. Seated. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> Let us look for God's newness uh, as we see what God has been doing and will do in the days and weeks and months ahead. We look upon uh, the prayers in the, of the people and we see that uh, uh, there's a, a bit of a well, it's hard to tell over here which, which in which day. So I'm not sure if today is Diane Gagnon's birthday or not. <laughs> is that right? <laughs> it is today. Okay. Well, Diane, you shared that birthday with my wife, Betsy. So, uh, you know, so today's hers too. And uh, she said that um, she's got her sister over and family and they uh, couldn't, can't stay long enough to get to service this morning. But uh, Betsy said for her present, you know, being, I guess, being a pastor's wife, I don't know, Amy, she said she wanted to uh, just sleep in for church instead of going to church on one, <laughs> one Sunday. <laughs> so I said, well, all right, you know, uh, begrudgingly, you know, no. Um, <laughs> uh, we also pray for um, uh, Patty Springle. Uh, she is carrying on. Uh, she was able to walk some yesterday, which is a huge improvement. Uh, David Beveridge is uh, in Greenville, um, having uh, had his pacemaker removed uh, after it was giving us some problems. So, uh, but he's he's there uh, working on a, the next plan. 
And Joyce Gutnick uh, is uh, continuing to need um, care and uh, prayers too. Uh, pray for uh, Baxley, that is uh, Drew and Charlie Hoover's grandson, as he is uh, you know, leaning into the battle with his family, the battle against uh, cancer. And uh, we are praying for um, Sam Jones, who is recovering from heart surgery, and for Iris Noya, uh, Barbara Hoey's friend, and uh, for Rick Carpenter, raised by Turner today. Let me see what others we have. Okay. Um, and Yvonne raises a prayer for Diana Lambeth. Uh, yes, you're, you're Diana, certainly, for complications after her surgery. Uh, Cheryl Young has a prayer for Susan Suggs. Uh, we need to uh, continue to pray for Donna Mason, uh, too. Allie Kittrell uh, raises a prayer for Karen and Sean Pumphrey. Uh, and uh, after a car crash, is that right, Allie? Oh dear, thank you. Uh, and for one uh, other than them, the, another person in the accident uh, lost their life. Um, that's so a tragedy all around. Um, and Bob Fowl asked for Alden, uh, prayer for Alden Thornton uh, in dealing with the ankle replacement. Uh, we have at least uh, two people here today uh, who have back from big surgeries and uh, that I know are, are with us and we're very uh, thankful to celebrate all those healings, and there may be others that uh, may be going on or that you uh, are so excited about. All of these together, yes? Uh, we need to continue praying for Richard Harker. Yes. Okay, some more meals this week for Richard Harker. Yes, he um, uh, seems to be back at home, but uh, uh, in and out with, uh, in, in care at the hospital sometimes. So, absolutely. Okay, all those uh, prayers we bring together before God as the one who knows uh, all these deeper than we do. So let us go before God together in prayer. As we move through this Lent season and into this new spring, Lord, uh, we look around and we're reminded that you have not forgotten this creation. And that in this first spring after the tremendous hurricane we've dealt with and continue to deal with, uh, you have been more than sufficient. Uh, you are creating new places and spaces new births uh, in families that have, have happened and others expected. Uh, Lord, all of these we bring before you as we think about your uh, undying and unfailing love. Uh, yet we know that uh, we are in Lent and as we move closer to your cross, uh, you give us encouragement uh, to be honest about our need for you, uh, to be, uh, uh, to take initiative to come to you whether that's in prayer, or scripture reading, or study, or fellowship with, with other believers, or whether it's coming to your table as we do today, uh, to partake in the meal that you gave us, the opportunity to uh, have that uh, unity uh, with your spirit. For all of these and all of that we have raised in prayer, uh, for those that we know and those that we don't know. For needs across the, and around the world. Oh God, we dedicate our hearts, our minds, and our attention to you and to your purposes. And we profess your name and our faith in you, as Paul talks about so, uh, so powerfully. And we will pray the prayer that you taught even saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Yeah.
The ushers may now come forward to pick, to receive our tithes, our gifts, and offerings. may be seated. Friends, we have been invited to this table, a table that, as I said earlier, is one of unity and understanding, that transcends our identities and our memories, that is for us the very presence of Jesus. And so as you come, I hope you will come uh, offering yourself to him as we will pray so in the prayer. Uh, if you have a need of uh, the elements to come to you, we can arrange that, and certainly we have a gluten-free option uh, for those that would need that. Uh, this is the table. You have made your confession, and your hearts are being made ready by Christ. So join together in 
the prayer that is found, I believe, on page 15 of your hymnal. And uh, there'll be some words uh, for this occasion that I will offer up for the fifth Sunday in Lent uh, from another resource. But you'll find that it intersects with your text there. Let us pray. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Extravagant God, you poured out your life in your covenant with your chosen people. And you poured out your lifeblood in the ministry and death of our son, your Son, Jesus Christ. You meet our meanness with your grace, our scarcity with your abundance and our suspicion with your generous trust. And so we give you thanks with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven. And with all your people on earth, we join in singing your unending praise. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Sharing God in Jesus, you attended a meal to celebrate Lazarus' resurrection. And so we gather today to celebrate Jesus in faith that even now you are preparing a feast that we will celebrate with you. Sanctify us that even as our flesh and blood decay, our hearts are made ready that we may meet you face to face. Send down your Holy Spirit that this bread of sustenance and wine of joy may be for us the body and blood of your Son, Jesus the Christ, who at supper with his disciples took the bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples. He said, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After the supper, he took the cup, and again he gave thanks to you, and he gave it to his disciples. And he said, drink from this, all of you. This is the blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us. And we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Almighty Father, when we know the price of everything and the value of nothing, may this meal remind us of the limitless joy you take in us. When we are full of criticisms of others or hatred of ourselves, may this sacrifice show us the goodness you see in us all. Bless us in touch that we may touch your gifts and one another as if we touch your body and blood. Bless our desire that in craving and longing we may discover deeper yearning for you. And renew the hearts of all your people that your whole church, seeking together the justice of your kingdom, may discover in the stranger the gifts that only come from you, through whom and with whom and in whom come all glory and honor and power, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The bread which we break together is the body of Christ, the presence of Jesus. Thanks be to God. The cup over which we give thanks is the blood of Christ, the sharing in the cup of salvation. Thanks be to God. At this time, the ushers direct, the choir comes, and then you come as uh, you're able, and we look forward to uh, sharing in this table with you. Let us pray. We thank you, Jesus, for reminding us, not only in our heads, but in our hearts, that we belong to you, and you are our Savior, and you will sustain us as you do through this meal, as we get closer to your cross. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Our hymn of going forth is, Take My Life and Let It Be, page 399. 